I think we'll get started. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Yegan Torbati. I'm a reporter with Reuters. Uh, and um, we're here to present a report that Colin and Karim have written about uh, the cyber threat posed by Iran. Um, of course, when this event was planned a few weeks ago, um, uh, we were sort of in a different situation in terms of what was happening domestically in Iran. And so, of course, we wanted to um, address what's happened in the last eight days or so. Um, so we are going to get to the report and the, so louder, sorry. Um, if they could turn up my mic a little bit. I think it's on. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So we are going to get to the actual contents of the report and the really interesting findings um, that Colin and Karim have gathered over the last couple of years. Um, but uh, at first, we wanted to kind of start by addressing um, what we've seen over the last um, eight days or so. So um, Karim, if you could just start off by um, describing a little bit sort of how do you see um, this is different from 2009 and what are you observing? So thank you all first for braving the cold and um, hi to all of those who are watching online. Um, just so we're all on the same page, I would argue that there are three main distinctions between today's protests and those of 2009. Uh, number one is scale, obviously. In 2009, you saw at one point two to three million people take to the streets at its largest. There was protests of hundreds of thousands. This scale has been uh, quite a bit smaller. The largest crowds I've seen this time around are perhaps tens of thousands of people. But what's much larger about uh, these protests are the geographic scope. In 2009, it was mostly the city of Tehran, some smaller protests in the city of Esfahan, but it was a lot of urban sophisticates. Uh, this time around, there are uh, perhaps dozens, uh, according to some estimates I've seen, up to 80 cities uh, throughout Iran that are experiencing protests. According to BBC Persia, 90% of these cities are essentially experiencing popular anti-government protests for the first time since 1979. So, so the geographic scope is much wider than it was in 1979. And I would argue another distinction this time around are the intensity of the slogans. In 2009, people were calling for their vote back. It was much more in the spirit of let's reform the Islamic Republic, at least initially, and then it, uh, it radicalized over time. But, but this time around, you have people who are just totally fed up with the entire system calling for death to the supreme leader, death to the Islamic Republic. And I thought from the beginning, first of all, uh, none of us predicted this would happen. I say it's akin to predicting anti national anti-Trump protests breaking out in Kentucky. Um, you know, these cities were the, thought to be the strongholds of the Islamic Republic, cities like Qom and Mashhad. So, so none of us uh, predicted this would happen. But when they, when they did, I think my, myself, the, one of the lessons I learned from both the 2009 uprisings in Iran and the Arab uprisings is that you know, there are no uh, shortcuts from authoritarianism to democracy. There's infomercials for eight-minute abs, but there's no such thing as eight-minute or eight-day democracy. And this is a regime which remains firmly resolved to stay in power. Uh, their security forces, uh, as far as we can tell from far away, are pretty cohesive. One of the things I say that about the Islamic Republic in contrast to the Shah's government, the Shah's government, many of their political, economic, military elite, they studied abroad or had foreign passports. So when the going got tough in 1978, they could make their lives outside of Iran. The Islamic Republic's uh, elite, military, political elite, uh, don't have that luxury, right? Uh, there's few places which these folks can go. They don't speak foreign languages or have foreign passports. And so I always thought for that reason, um, this current leadership led by the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, um, they're willing to kill a lot of people, to kill en masse, to, to stay in power. Um, but I don't think it's a society which is willing to die en masse to try to take power. And so for that reason, I, I, I've always thought that the odds, we can salute the courage of these uh, protesters, and we can, from, from a U.S. perspective, try to do everything in our power to inhibit the Islamic Republic's ability to black out communications and repress en masse. Um, but I always thought we needed to be sober about uh, their prospects for uh, success. So. And, and so given um, the, uh, 
the sort of repression of the protests that we've seen in the past um, eight days. Colin, I was wondering, just to tie it into the subject of the report and the event today, um, can you tell us what you've observed about um, what steps the government has taken to limit communications, um, to slow down the internet, and what, whatever else you may have seen? Well, I think one of the things that's interesting is that you've seen a sort of uh, drastic and, and, and consequential reintroduction uh, of the sorts of censorship that was common during the Ahmadinejad era. And so what you saw, for example, I think that the historical parallel is the uh, 2013 presidential election. In the, the lead up to the presidential election, you saw a very aggressive blocking of circumvention tools, tools that are used to bypass Iran's filtering regime. Uh, you saw the targeting of dissidents with malware. And uh, eventually, actually, right after the official list of candidates was announced up until the election, you saw extremely aggressive uh, um, throttling overall of, of bandwidth within the country. Uh, actually, after Rouhani was elected, these sorts of tactics had generally subsided. While there was still censorship of, of social networks and, and, and social media platforms, it, there was sort of a, a, a sustaining of the status quo. Things didn't get better, but they didn't necessarily get worse. In certain ways, you know, overall internet speeds got, uh, were, were slowly improved. Access to 3G, 4G was, was introduced. Um, but you know you didn't see Twitter unblocked, Facebook unblocked, and you saw the rise of Telegram as a, as a service which ultimately eclipsed everything else and, and was not necessarily filtered. Uh, in fact, you saw the Rouhani administration would stake political capital on uh, Telegram not being filtered uh, and, and these services being available. So you know, uh, the February 2016 parliamentary election, there was a lot of pressure uh, to censor. And while there was a blocking of circumvention tools, uh, largely uh, the Rouhani administration was able to resist hardliners' calls for the blocking of, of Telegram and others. Uh, what was really interesting is in the, the presidential election this year, uh, a, a number of the, the companies that provide circumvention tools were kind of in war rooms. They had their, uh, their, they had their uh, back pocket mechanisms to uh, evade any sort of thing the government would throw it at, at them. And what was surprising is nothing happened. There was no, there was no filtering. And, and it was largely, you know, uh, things were left open. And then suddenly, within the course of a couple of days of these protests breaking out, everything started to get shut down. And there was no investment of political capital. And so what you've seen, at least, is the blocking of Telegram, which the Rohan administration had, had resisted for four years. Uh, and you saw uh, the throttling of, of internet. Now, it's really hard to, to understand. Uh, internet measurement is, is extremly difficult. It's, it's a science uh, in, in and of itself. The internet is a complex thing, and it's hard to understand the totality of what the government is, is potentially doing uh, overall, but especially for somebody who, who's in, for example, rural of Oz. Um, so, so we have a lot of rumors, and we have a lot of uh, sort of uh, uh, statements that have been made that maybe the international internet has slowed down, where been slowed down, whereas domestic access is 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 the same as always. We know that circumvention tools are are, are blocked. We know that certain social media platforms, uh, such as Telegram, have have been blocked. And so we know that there's been a, a rampant and and very aggressive increase of censorship. We don't necessarily know. It's harder to know uh, uh, what the comparable change in the surveillance regime has been. We don't know, for example, if people are going out in protest with their cell phones, if those, those uh, cell phones are being identified at certain locations and that those people are being rounded up. We don't quite know yet whether there's been a, an identification of protesters and spear phishing campaigns against protesters. So we at least know that there has been definitely a, a, a specific focus and, and a directed focus on these protests by the censorship regime, it looks like there is, uh, there has been some cases where it looks like there has been malware used targeting certain uh, reformist or oppositional properties, um, but we don't necessarily know the totality of, of how that circumstance has changed. Um, just taking the big picture, I mean, what Colin was saying about how after Rouhani's election, things had opened up a little bit. I saw anecdote after anecdote in the news media about how 
you know, ordinary Iranians uh, away from Tehran would see images on, on Instagram of, you know, wealthy um, Iranians in Tehran, um, you know, boasting about how much money they were spending on their pets and, you know, showing off their SUVs. And this had sort of stoked a lot of um, anger throughout the country. Um, the President Rouhani, the budget that he had um, publicized that sort of um, made clear how much money certain um, security organs and uh, foundations were getting um, was spread through Telegram and shared. Um, do you think after these protests are suppressed that um, Rouhani will lose that argument, that um, you know, he won't be able to say that, okay, we should you know, keep the internet speeds relatively high and, and you know, not censor as much, or is that going to um, continue to be the same? Where do you see that going? Well, let me take your first point first, because I think it's a very important one. Uh, George Packer of The New Yorker wrote a piece, and <laughs> I think it was in The New York Times, over 10 years ago, and the title was, When, when There Sees Here. And he was talking about this in a global context, but basically, when people around the world, uh, living in Africa and Asia, um, who are, are living in some cases you know, at or below the poverty line, um, when they start through social media, cable <coughs> television, uh, Telegram, WhatsApp, they start to see how others around the world are living. How is that going to impact them psychologically? And I think that phenomenon we've seen in the United States and, and certainly uh, in a country like Iran, one of the stats which jumped out at me when these protests began, I was researching a piece for The Atlantic, was that in 2009, one million, Iranian, uh, one million Iranians had smartphones. Today, 48 million Iranians have smartphones. And so I think that the first point you said, which is this anger and disenchantment towards how many working class Iranians think uh, nouveau riche and upper class Iranians are living, I think that is incredibly powerful. The other thing I say is that in, in America, you know, if you if you if you catch your politician stealing or your clergyman stealing, that is much more angering to you, right? Because these are individuals who are supposed to be in positions of moral authority and responsibility. And in Iran, your politician and clergyman are oftentimes the same people, right? Because it's a theocratic system. And so when you have a theocracy which is uh, plundering and committing repression from a moral pedestal. I think this is just incredibly angering to people. And so Colin and I have talked about this a lot in terms of kind of internet speed and, and things like this. Um, it, it just seems to me that this is a train which has left the tracks. Now that the Islamic Republic has, has embraced um, the internet and everyone has uh, a, a smartphone, um, they can't turn the off switch. Um, and the, the, the challenge we seem to have is that when there are moments like this, all of us say, okay, we have to think about ways to inhibit the regime's ability to control information and repress and monopolize communications. And then the moment passes, and then our attention goes elsewhere. And then, uh, you know, when, when there is another tumult, whether it's in Iran or another authoritarian regime, um, we're, we're, we're kind of caught flat-footed again. So, so I, I hope this time around there, there's maybe more of a sustained conversation about you know, what, what practical measures. Um, Vice President Pence had a Washington Post op-ed saying we, we stand with the Iranian people. And, and I just think that rather than um, the, the statements which are made by U.S. officials or the tweets by U.S. presidents, what's much more constructive is what practically can be done to uh, to inhibit uh, these regimes, whether it's Iran or another regime, their ability to, to keep their populations back. Just a final question before we get to the actual content of the report. What, what practically can be done? Are there you know, you know, relatively easy steps that the U.S. could take or, or uh, tech companies could take to ensure that Iranians have access to their tools? Well, I think to start off on a positive note, <clears throat> um, Iran has been, Iranians, have been the beneficiary of a sort of a, a, what is often called the internet freedom agenda, which is a, 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 a set of programs and funding which has bipartisan support uh, intended to open up uh, access to information inside of the country. And so probably the primary example of that would be the majority of the tools that are provided to Iranians to bypass the filtering regime are actually funded by uh, US 
uh, and European governments. And these are safe and secure tools uh, rather than privately provided or domestically provided tools uh, which open up a, uh, access to inter the internet. And this funding has also been very useful in making sure that at times like this, uh, in, in which there is a, a sort of a scaling up of the blocking of these tools, there are people on the other side whose specific job is to make sure that they remain available. I think that that's a success story, and I think ways in which uh, there has been attempts to be better. Uh, and, and to open up access, and there's, but there's still or providing VPNs to Iranians. Now, the, these policies have, uh, have led to certain American tech companies opening up certain services that otherwise wouldn't been, be available, but there are still very important uh, uh, products and, and platforms that are, are, are still not accessible because there are sanctions concerns. Uh, one of, the, the, one of the, the areas of focus has been Google's App Engine service. This is a service that has been used in Egypt uh, and, and the Emirates, in order to bypass uh, uh, government-imposed blocking of secure communications tools. Unfortunately, because of certain compliance concerns, uh, Google App Engine is not available in Iran. And so subsequently, what could be a powerful tool for bypassing uh, the filtering regime is, is not available on a selective basis. I think that these are areas in which uh, there could be a focus of the United States government in collaboration with the private sector in order to, to make services that are unavailable uh, available. Because the last thing that we want is there to be you know, two filtering regimes. One, the Iranian government, and the second, the American government. We, we want to make sure uh, this, the, this thing that we, we can all agree on, which is that Iranians should have access to the internet, uh, is, is protected and secure and open. So on that note, let's get into the actual findings of the report. Um, it's, a, it's a really remarkable report. I think it adds a lot in terms of helping us all understand the strategic um, intent behind um, Iran's cyber activities um, and beyond just uh, its targeting of um, private sector uh, or even government entities in the West or in Saudi Arabia, um, the act actions that it's taking um, within Iran um, against both dissidents but also uh, reformist uh, uh, factions and even um, its own government officials, um, and then also in the Iranian diaspora. So I was wondering if, um, Karim, you could start out by telling us a little bit about the genesis of the report and uh, how it came about. So <clears throat> I think that you know our timing um, has been incredibly fortuitous that the report is launched this week when this is a timely topic, but we actually began this conversation, Colin and I, over two years ago, and it was shortly after the arrest of a, a close friend of mine, Siamak Namazi, who has been in prison over two years in Iran since October 2015. And one of the things that the regime did after Siamak, uh, in the hours after he was imprisoned, and we talk about this in the report, was that they took over his email accounts and they pretended to be him, and they sent emails to a lot of his contacts, including folks in this room, including myself, saying, um, you know, pretending to be Siamak and saying this is an op-ed that he had written about the JCPOA and whether they could, um, the recipients could edit that op-ed. And, um, and if you open that uh, attachment, uh, the Islamic Republic could take over your, your Gmail account and in some cases your computer. And they did uh, incredible damage. <laughs> Um, as a result, and, and so over the years, I had also been, been, the Islamic Republic attempted to hack my accounts, and the way I know this is that um, for those of you in the room who you use Gmail, I'd encourage all of you, if you haven't already, to use two-step notification. Because what happens with two-step notification is that you'll get a text message when someone is trying to log into your Gmail account from an unfamiliar device. And there was one morning, I have some, some friends who work at Google, so they encouraged me to do this years ago. And one morning, quite early, 6 a.m., I, I received 
dozens of texts back to back. Someone is trying to get into your, or your what is your, your, uh, your, your passcode? Google will send you a, a text message uh, as a, as a two-step uh, entry into your Gmail account. And I kept getting dozens of these codes. So it was clear to me someone was trying to log on to my Gmail from an unfamiliar device. So I woke up my poor friends who work in Mountain View, because it was, you know, it was very early in the morning DC time. It was even earlier, three hours earlier Mountain View time. And uh, they said, yeah, we're, we're actually watching this happen in real time. And they could tell, um, in, in some cases, you know, this was coming from Iran if, uh, if these ha the hackers weren't sophisticated enough to be able to conceal uh, their location. So, so this is a, a topic that you know, I've been interested, about, interested in for, for personal reasons, obviously the issue of 2009 as well. And, and Colin um, said to me you know, that he had been monitoring this for a very long time. And so uh, we had an initial conversation and he sent me his findings, which were, which were incredible. Um, but I'm so ignorant about this topic that I, I had no idea uh, about you know, two thirds of what he was sending me and the, the terminology and what was going on. And so that's why, to his credit, Colin was unbelievably patient with me. You know, this was like a, a two year writing process and our editors at Carnegie were, were really fantastic as well. Um, I'm reminded of something that uh, Walter Isaacson, who was a wonderful biographer, told me once about his book about Albert Einstein. He wrote a great biography of Albert Einstein, and he said that he said I had to relearn calculus so my readers didn't have to. And so the the challenge of this report was me learning from scratch all of these things which I knew nothing about. Um, so all of you hopefully won't necessarily have to. Uh, it's I, I thought if I don't understand it, then you know the the broader readership may not. And we wanted to make this report not just for a tech and cyber crowd, but something which is accessible to a lay audience. So Colin was incredibly patient with me if there was a sentence or a term I didn't understand. I, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? And I think in the process, he told me himself, this was like an MA master's degree in writing uh, for you. So, so that was basically the genesis of it. Okay. Um, Tim, I want to bring you into the conversation as well. Um, you know, the report describes uh, sort of a, a kind of a fuzzy connection between these Iranian threat actors and the actual Iranian government. And it's not, um, you know, it's very rare that the Iranian government actually takes credit for um, any single attack or even there are even contradictions in what it says about its own cyber capabilities. Um, can you put that in context? Is that sort of, um, is, are there parallels when it comes to China's behavior, Russia's behavior? Like, how should we um, read that particular aspect of Iran's um, you know, cyber activities? Yeah, I think there are two aspects of that. The, the first one is the technical aspect where because of the internet and how it works that you can conceal the origin of, of, of an attack. But I think the report and some of Colin's research also shows that um, what's often called as the attribution problem is not a question necessarily of if it can be attributed, but rather when. And that if an actor has the res either the wits as Colin does or additional resources like a state does, you're able to actually trace back a lot of the malicious activity because uh, a malicious actor might not be careful and might not be uh, very good at concealing their identity. And the, the indictments that we've seen come out of the US government, for example, provide very good insight into, into that. And the second piece is that certain states tend to use actors that are detached from the states to incre further increase plausible deniability. Um, if you look at proxy actors in, when it comes to malicious cyber activity, I think sometimes we are quick to jump to the conclusion that this is a new phenomenon when it comes to cyber. But when you actually start digging a little deeper and you compare countries, it turns out that it's more an extension of how states have been using these actors in the past. And that I think uh, Iran is a fantastic case study for how a country within the span of a decade, I think the first reports about when Iran started developing offensive uh, cyber tools date back to about 2007. So within the span of a decade, Iran was able to develop these capabilities and essentially was, was using its existing system and, and was able to mobilize these, these actors to, to um, project their, their political power in, in that space. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get into, Colin, what you actually did observe. And you, you, uh, the, the report is based obviously on open source research, but also research that you conducted, primary research, where you actually observed some of these attacks happening. So I was wondering if you could like bring out a few anecdotes for us who are, you know, like Kerry, maybe cyber illiterate, explain to us sort of how that works and then what, what did you actually observe? 
So I think, I, I think maybe part of the answer to that comes out of the genesis of this. What was interesting is, is that uh, I've had the fortune of, of having relationship, uh, you know, like relationships, working partnerships with members of the Iranian civil society and human rights community for, for some time. One of the things that was often talked about is the, the state-based hacking uh, uh, campaigns. But 2010, 2011, as best as I could, could, I could never get examples of somebody getting spearfished, having their account stolen, getting uh, receiving malware. Uh, 2012, I started to really specifically focus, you know, raising attention, saying, if, if you get anything, send it to me. Still nothing. And then suddenly, two months before the, the 2013 election, I get too much. It was just too much. Too much malware, too much phishing. And what was interesting about this is that, uh, you know, having looked back at it a little bit later, and especially in the context of, of private sector reports, all of a sudden the groups that I was seeing sending malware to dissidents outside of the country were groups that were getting published on later as having tried to engage in military espionage, having tried to attack uh, a, a, you know, Saudi oil refinery, having tried to get into a US government system. These were the same groups. This was the same malware. And, and so what, what's, what's useful is, is that you know, within the cybersecurity community, there are you know, professional practices uh, that give you access to a great deal of broader insight into to what's happening in certain campaigns. An example that I've given that is, uh, is accessible is just the, uh, the principle of sinkholing. You know, when you get malware, the way that malware com uh, often communicates is, is that it has to communicate back to, to attackers. Uh, often what it does is it contacts a domain name, like mymalware.com, in order to understand where to send uh, the, the files that it has stolen. You know, there are a variety of ways of, of getting access to that domain name. Often you can ask domain name providers. Often that domain name has expired because the malware is older and you can just re-register it. And so suddenly you can uh, potentially interdict the communications of, of this malware network. Uh, if you're sitting on that, you're suddenly seeing who's been compromised. That starts to tell you the, the broader profile. And so you've gone from one dissident sitting in London that received a malware to a, a, a broader sense of, of who was targeted or compromised by this campaign. In other cases, I, I think uh, the first case uh, was that the malware that was communicating actually had a, an embedded uh, username and password. And if you just connected to that same re resource with that username and password, uh, you could see all of the other files that were stolen. It was pretty simple to, to, to understand who was being targeted and, and being compromised. And so this, what this provided us, I, I think, was, which was uniquely valuable, is kind of like a longitudinal understanding of what somebody was doing at one time. And, and by having sat in, in this and having maintained these relationships and, and having gotten a broader sense of, of, of other campaigns, we could start to piece it together. And what we saw was that there was a lot of, uh, uh, there were a number of reports that were being published, especially uh, uh, about attacks against the private sector, against economic infrastructure, against defense companies. And these were often the same groups, the same malware that we were tracking. These were often, you know, the same people that were going after domestic dissidents were the same people that were going after regional adversaries. And, and it actually makes sense, right? You know, what is the Islamic Republic afraid of? Kareem can answer this better than mm -hmm. I can. But, you know, my childish attempt at, at, at uh, comparative politics would say, uh, I, I think that the Iranian government is not necessarily as afraid of external invasion mm -hmm. as they are internal dissent. And so if you're prioritizing your resources, yes, you, you might try to find, you know, like uh, technical information about a European fighter jet. That might be a useful thing for you to know. But the existential fight, the regime stability fight, is against reformist opposition, is against, uh, uh, even more so, is against people in the periphery of the country who might have uh, grievances about how uh, minor ethnic minorities are, are, are treated. It might be uh, a, a BBC journalist in London who is very capable of digging up dirt about economic corruption. And so what we saw was, was there was a lot of this sort of overlap between these campaigns that we were seeing the private sector write about and the campaigns that we were seeing uh, targeting people that were familiar with the, the, the community. And so it, was, it, it became 
interesting and useful to start talking, looking at this in a, in a broader sense and start to look at these themes. And, and these themes are repeated and they're common and they're obvious. Uh, and, and what we wanted to do is really kind of, uh, I, I think, take out those themes and, and show them to a broader audience. And can I, sorry, if I can just share a few anecdotes as well in case I forget later. Um, and maybe these are anecdotes slash questions for Colin. I mean, in the course of this report, I would get emails and texts from Colin and he'd say, um, do you know such and such individual? And it was oftentimes a senior, uh, former Obama administration official. And he'd say, um, can you let them know that there is going to be an email in their inbox and it's purporting to be someone from Human Rights Watch with a report about the human rights situation in X country. Tell them not to open that report because that's a, a phishing attack and if they open it, their, their computer or their uh, email account is going to be compromised. I guess the question for you is how the hell did you know these things? I never, <laughs> I never understood uh, or figured that out. Um, the second, which is also an anecdote, something I find funny, it may have no strategic slash cyber uh, consequences, but I, I was always amused how these individuals who are essentially working for the Islamic Republic of Iran, um, either you found out they had hardcore pornography on their laptops, um, or they would actually deface others using uh, pornography, um, which um, is, is an interesting paradox that these kind of people working for an Islamist theocracy engage in that kind of stuff. Um, the third thing is how, the, one of my main takeaways, one of the main things I learned from this is the parallels between the way Iran projects power externally and how it uses cyber, which is essentially to use organizations like Hezbollah or Shia militias or the Houthis in Yemen in which they have plausible deniability. So they can say, well, no, these, are, these folks are independent. You know, I, I remember years ago when I was based in Tehran with the International Crisis Group and I would interview Iranian officials about Hezbollah, they would say, no, no, Hezbollah, uh, we only provide them moral support. That, that's it. Now, nowadays, Hassan Nasrallah says you can't sanction us because all of our support and resources come from Iran. But they have this kind of plausible deniability in, in a way to be able to say, um, you know, it, it implicitly <coughs> signals what Iran is capable of, but on the surface, they can also deny that they have any involvement with it. Do you want to give us, like, enlighten us a little bit on some of the specific attacks and, and phishing attempts that you witnessed? And the porn stuff. <laughs> the porn stuff. <laughs> there's a lot of porn stuff. <laughs> and there's a, a lot of cases in which you see uh, very professional, um, let's say, intellectual class people uh, unfortunately falling for spear phishing attempts that appear to be uh, uh, nude pictures from a, an attractive young young woman. You kind of you're embarrassed for that individual at that time. <laughs> you, want, you want to be like, why did you fall for that? Um, you know, I, I think that I, I think again the value is, and 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 I would love to surface this more over time. So there's so many illustrative uh, e examples of how these attacks tell us broader things. You know, one of the things uh, that I am going to, I, I think that we'll, we'll have the opportunity to surface a little bit more, but we allude to it in the paper, is that if, if you take, for example, the first public illustration of, of Iran's, uh, uh, you know, cyber capacity, it's, it's the Iranian cyber army. Uh, you know, over, starting in December 2009, uh, I think in response to perceptions that the internet was uh, being used as, as American cyber warfare against Iran, uh, you had you had groups, defacement groups, uh, a defacement group suddenly, uh, you know, vandalizing certain opposition websites, certain Israeli websites, and and actually, you know, their, their largest uh, their largest victories or accomplishments was uh, briefly defacing Twitter, as well as briefly defacing the, the Chinese search engine Baidu. What was really interesting is, is that you know, we, we were given access to some historical uh, records about domain registrations, and we actually found a, a, a little bit when Baidu sued its registrar, and we were able to, to connect the dots. And, and what was interesting is, is that this, this campaign, when it was published, there was, there was a number of op-eds and statements saying, you know, this is Iran's ability to inflict damage on, on, on the United States. This is indication that the Russians are supporting the Iranians in cyber warfare. This is indication that Iranians are a first-tier cyber actor, that they're able to take down Twitter. And, and when we start to kind of put 
the elements together and, and string things together, it starts to look like actually the person that was the Iranian cyber army was potentially maybe one person who knew how to speak English mm -hmm. and knew how to socially manipulate and work some of these domain name registrars, some of these elements of, of, of the internet infrastructure uh, to his benefit and had been doing so over the course of, of six years for, uh, for cybercrime, who, who had been stealing domain names and reselling them on the market. And so, you know, and we actually, I think, I found, I think I found the, the guy. I think his name is Omid, and, and his social media profile talks about how he likes hot dogs and making big money. <laughs> and, and, he, and he lives in Shiraz. And I, I think that, that that was such a, a, an enormously useful illustration of, of this, this asymmetry, right? And, and especially how Iran could, through proxies, appear to be larger than it is. The Iranian cyber army, as a, as a concept, is still banded about often, right? It has taken on its own kind of life, despite the fact that there hasn't been any activity in its name since 2013. But what it showed is Omid and Shiraz could, could project this you know, like global ambition uh, in, in terms of, of the media. And so what we've tried to do is we've tried to connect these sorts of things. We've, we've been able to say, you know, uh, the second case that I, I think that we really anchor ourselves on is, is a malware campaign uh, that was called Mati, which was the first, uh, pub, you know, the first published report in, uh, by cybersecurity community, uh, companies. Um, uh, Kaspersky was one of the companies that published on it. And this was a broad, you know, a somewhat broad campaign of, of cyber espionage using indigenously developed malware uh, that had clearly been effective at compromising a number of American and Israeli institutions to gain some access to data. What's interesting, and, and we didn't do the, the attribution on this, somebody else had found it, it looks like basically that came out of the Iranian debasement community. That some people inside of the country since 2007, 2008, had been developing malware, selling it mostly to spy on people's girlfriends, and that that was, uh, that, that was instrumentalized in order to pursue these more political ambitions after the fact. And, and similarly, you know, this had been happening since 2008, but suddenly you see in 2010, these being directed towards uh, global and domestic ambitions. And, and, and in that vein, we, all, we see this is a recurrent theme that these groups that had been defacing all of a sudden in 2009 and 2010 realized that they can form private companies. And you often see the vestiges of these you know, quasi uh, uh, penetration company information, uh, penetration testing information security companies that are, are formed, that are small but inconsequential, but seem to be contracting to the state. Hmm. All of a sudden in 2010, the state seems to be hiring people to, to be doing its work uh, to be doing some sort of uh, uh, espionage work or, or, or to be doing cyber operations. And, and this is pretty, pretty common. When you read the reports from the private sector, you see a lot of these groups suddenly are interested in 2009. And it really kind of, uh, I think, again, illustrates a point, which was assumed, but really kind of with information illustrates a point, which is it, it, seems, to be the, it seems to have been the green movement and Stuxnet that really prompted Iran to be aware that this was a, an area in which it was attacked, and it is an area in which it could retaliate, and it is an area in which it could pursue its regional and domestic interests uh, through. Yeah, go ahead, Tim. I think just to build on Colin's point, I think Iran is a really fascinating case study because it also shows this interplay between the international politics and the domestic politics. And we also had a New York Times article that talked about the internet in a suitcase and specifically about Iran. If I sit in Tehran and I read this article about the New York Times, uh, in the New York Times, that makes me also imagine all sorts of things about what the US is up to, right? So the, 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 what's so fascinating about the Iranian case that Colin alluded to earlier is with the same groups targeting dissidents abroad, focusing on dissidents at home, but also companies, mm -hmm. is how Governments like Tehran, but also others, for example, I think how the Kremlin thinks about this, how Beijing thinks about this, looking at this lens through information security and the control of information in a much broader sense than how we usually think about cybersecurity. This event has the tagline with, with cyber attached to it, right? But I think some, a lot of times in the West, we fall some, a bit in this trap of only looking at critical infrastructure, which 
coincidentally, last year, all of a sudden changed with the election interference and people starting thinking much more about content and the, the, the role that that could play. But Iran is a really interesting case study for how it's using these offensive tools across the board for both the domestic and the external projection of power that the regime is trying to turn into. Um, the methods that Iran does employ and what Colin was mentioning, you know, how one person could sort of, you know, pose as the Iranian cyber army and really kind of inflate um, Iran's cyber capabilities. Um, what challenge does that pose for the U.S. or for sort of just global entities that uh, want to enforce um, any kind of developing uh, cyber norm or cyber rule that, that, that the global community is really working on? Like, how does Iran fit into that or challenge uh, that goal? It's a great question, and I think one also with regard to the upcoming year that I think the White House is thinking about in terms of how it can impose more consequences on actors generally that engage in malicious cyber activity. If we take the example of the US indictment that came out that indicted seven Iranian nationals, it's a good case study because it shows three people who were part of one company and then four who were part of another company. And as part of the research I did for a separate project, I found that the four Iranians who were part of that one company have been publicly boasting about their web defacements on uh, Zone H, which is a, a website for hackers where you can go if, you've, if you web de deface the website and you can t claim credit for it. And then in 2012, they all of a sudden disappear after two years of posting these web defacements. And that's exactly the point in time where the US indictment claims that they started working with this other company, including the one individual who has a relationship with the Islamic Revolutionary Guard. And that's when the DDoS attacks happen against US financial institutions. Mm -hmm. Um, so we focus so much. We focus very much on the control of information during this event so far. There's a, the other dimension of it with Saudi Aramco, the DDoS attacks against U.S. financial institutions, and the U.S. indictment so far has been the most public example of what the U.S. government has done in response by mm -hmm. trying to publicly name and shame to demonstrate that attribution is possible, that we can find out who is behind it. But what you can actually do with regard to these individuals. It's highly unlikely that these four will be arrested anytime soon unless they happen to travel to a country on vacation that happens to have an extradition treaty with the United States. Um, covert means, but that gets into a, um, we might find out in a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. But it, it's a really hard question that I think is somewhat unique to, to cyber because unlike international terrorism, where you have a few individuals, they still need to be geographically close to their target. Mm -hmm. When it comes to hacking, that's no longer the case. Um, so Kennedy made the point that um, Iran's use of cyber tools uh, sort of reflects its use of proxies in, in the real world as well. Um, one thing I wanted to, that was really interesting in the report is that um, for anyone who's a scholar of Iran, you're immediately aware of how factionalized the system is and how internally divided it is. And you document a lot of this, this actually happening where um, people like the foreign minister uh, are, are, are uh, you know, attacked or fished by um, presumably people connected to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, um, former uh, reformist politicians. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what you observed on that front? Well, so actually, if we go back, uh, some of the oldest groups, uh, so there's a group that's connected with the Ministry of, uh, of Intelligence. Uh, it's colloquially named uh, within the cybersecurity community, Magic Kitten. Uh, Magic Kitten actually, it turns out, had been thoroughly compromised by the NSA. And there are helpful slides that show who they were targeting uh, because this was a training session uh, within the, the NSA, the, uh, a, a presentation from a training session that had been uh, leaked by, by Snowden. And what you look is that while they redact the addresses, they, they, they've missed a couple. Uh, and, and you look and actually the addresses in, in those slides are, are within the country. And, and in fact, they're, uh, they are uh, institutions in Qom, they are uh, media institutions that are affiliated with the, the, the Iranian government, uh, such as uh, IRIB, the, the state media broadcaster. They are uh, uh, semi-attached uh, uh, agencies like the Center for Strategic Re Research, who in 2010 was actually, uh, which in 2010 was actually headed by Rouhani. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what that starts to tell you is, is that this group in 2010, the oldest appearing group, from the outset was targeting the Iranian government itself. And if you take that forward, about every, nearly every single group that has been published on was actually also targeting Iranian government officials. So the first group that we start looking at, again, is colloquially called um, uh, a Flying Kitten. It was published in, it first published by, by uh, FireEye in the Operation Saffron Rose report. And what was interesting is that that group 
uh, which was targeting the aviation industry at the time, which was targeting Boeing and others, had in a, on repeated occasions attempted to steal the credentials, the passwords for uh, uh, Foreign Minister Zarif's Gmail account. And you, you move forward, this is also, you know, this is, this is occurring in early 2014, late 2013 at, at earliest. Uh, this, is, this is in the middle of the nuclear negotiations. And, and you, you move forward and everyone around Rouhani especially, uh, his immediate family members, have clearly been targeted. Uh, his, his brother, Hussein Faridun, who was, uh, who was, I think, potentially for political purposes targeted in, in a corruption trial, but has clearly not necessarily been, uh, the, the, the hardline establishment has not been friendly with him, not been happy about him, has been repeatedly targeted uh, by spear phishing attempts. You, you look forward and even we found cases in which, uh, actually the, the, the report has missed uh, as, as early as, as, as this August, Zarif had once again be, been targeted by spear phishing. And so what it appears is, is that you know, uh, even members of the government themselves are targeted. You, know, you, you take sort of a, a, an outer shell of that, if you move out a little bit more, reformist politicians uh, are similarly targeted. People who you know, purport to ascribe to the, the, the tenets of the Islamic Republic are repeatedly the most commonly compromised, targeted uh, uh, demographics. Uh, you know, we even saw some of Ahmadinejad's uh, cabinet members being targeted in, in this process as well. So I think that that's been, it's, it, was, it was very compelling to see how much there's sort of a, it reflects the paranoia of, of the state in, in who they are targeting. Is there any um, political faction that's not targeted? For instance, uh, is there any uh, cyber actor that's targeting IRGC generals? Uh, we don't necessarily see that, but you know, one of the questions that I've received is, do you see this, this factionalism, right? So, and again, Kareem can talk much more competently, so my, my uh, barely informed understanding is, is that the way that the power structure lies within the security apparatus is that uh, the, the, the IRGC decidedly falls under the Supreme Leader. Uh, the Ministry of Intelligence uh, purports to fall under the, uh, the, the President, uh, but you know, it's, it, the individual who's appointed is always a, you know, a, a very hardline individual, uh, and, and so it's maybe the least controlled of all of the, the, the ministries. And so one of the questions that I've received is, do you see them hacking each other? Mm. And, and we don't necessarily see as much of the, uh, I have not seen as much of the Ministry of Intelligence side. They actually seem to be more competent in their cyber actions. And so I, I haven't seen as much of, of that activity. I, I think that that would be awfully audacious if they're trying to hack mm -hmm. the IRGC. Um, I wouldn't rule it out, but we haven't necessarily seen They haven't it. tried to hack Khamenei's Gmail account. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he has a Gmail account. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How does that strike you, Karim? I mean, um, one thing I also noticed in the report is that uh, while Iran has invested some amount of money into this, the, the capabilities remain pretty third tier. Um, yes. And whether that's because of because they just haven't given enough money or brain drain within Iran, I mean, can you identify some of those factors as well? So this was another thing that I, I, I learned in the process of um, doing this with Colin, that even a third tier cyber actor like Iran um, can be very effective by preying on fifth-tier cyber actors. So they may not be able to successfully hack Israel or the United States, but you know Saudi Aramco is sitting around not really paying attention to these types of things, and their attack on Aramco caused enormous damage. Um, one of the, the things I, I, I enjoyed in uh, co-authoring the report was uh, Colin would just sometimes say things to try to get me to understand something, kind of a a simple anecdote, and, and I'd say, yeah, that, that's actually uh, incredibly informative. And I remember one of the things he said was, you know, he's trying to explain to me that very simple methods can have huge consequences. He said, well, the attack on the Democratic National uh, Committee in 2016 was just a very simple phishing email, I guess, to, to John Podesta. And so that's what I think the Islamic Republic has done very well is preying on either individuals or companies or countries who really weren't focused on these things. Uh, and, and now, as, as a result, um, you know, the rest of the world is much more focused. And I guess this is a question for both. T Tim, your, your book has a, uh, as a chapter, your forthcoming book has a chapter on Iran. One of the things that I 
uh, think about, and I think US officials think about, is kind of the double-edged sword of using cyber as a weapon. Because once you launch an attack like Stuxnet on Iran or very sophisticated cyber attacks, it's a little different than conventional military attacks and that you know Iran can reverse engineer in some cases uh, or better understand how these uh, attacks were conceived, uh, learn from it, and then use it as a tool themselves. I'm curious whether that, I'm sure I've oversimplified that. But. No, I think you point to a really important piece where if we take Stuxnet as an example, and the code that was used during the operation was designed to only really unleash the damage in that specific system because it was tied so that if it infected that system and that system was connected to another system, another level of the, the code would, would, would be executed. So the more sophisticated you are as an actor, I think the, the more targeted you can be because you have the level of expert, you have the expertise, the knowledge, and the level of sophistication to make your cyber weapon much more targeted. If you are less sophisticated as an actor, be it Iran or, for example, North Korea, then you might still be able to cause a significant amount of damage because you're actually less sophisticated and don't have the knowledge and expertise to limit your harm mm -hmm. only for the intended target. Mm -hmm. So I think the WannaCry uh, uh, ransomware that we saw last year is a very good example of that where because so many of the systems remain unprotected, most people don't use two-factor as, mm -hmm. as you do, um, there are so many low-hanging fruits that remain for even low-level actors um, to, to cause a significant amount of damage. Another example is the blackout in, in Ukraine that occurred in 2015, December, or 2014, I might be wrong on the year here. Um, but the damage that was caused by the malware, by the, through the outage, was not through the malware that was used. It was actually people having gained access to the systems and then using the legitimate credentials of the people operating the, the plant and then causing the blackout. The malware that was used as part of the operation was only used to obfuscate what was happening and to de delay the recovery of the system. Mm -hmm. So again, the, the actual effect of taking the power out was the re result of gaining access to legitimate credentials. It wasn't because there was a super sophisticated mm -hmm. malware that mm -hmm. actually caused that effect. And I think that's the, the worrisome trend that you have the ability for even a small or unsophisticated group of actors to cause harm if they have the intent to do so. Um, so I think we'll open it up for Q&A, um, for questions from the audience. Um, so uh, if we can have the mics. Um, yes, this gentleman here. Sure. And if you could identify yourself uh, and what institution you're representing. Uh, Nikosar Abangan. Uh, my question is for Karim. Uh, regarding the signs of what happened in Iran in the last 10 days, uh, had you and your, let's say, other um, people you know from different think tanks, uh, paid attention to the riots in places that were hit by water crisis, what we saw like in Ize, what we saw in Toy Khan, what we saw in Ahbaz, and all the places that people had gone to the streets uh, for um, environmental problems like dust storms or water crisis, and also there were people killed actually like uh, in the last two years in parts of Iran. and. Uh, People, some people had said that we will have problems of, let's say, hundreds of thousands of uh, or millions of my, uh, immigrants because of what the government has done in the last 20-something years. Thank you. So I've paid attention to it because I'm on your email list. So I see what you've written about it, and I, and I read it. And, and I think that you know, in addition to the environmental crises, there was the, the recent earthquake in, in Kurdistan in which there was you know, mass outrage at, at the colossal mismanagement and, and poor response measures. Um, listen, uh, to make a very uh, a much broader point, one of the um, reports we authored at Carnegie a few years ago, myself and Ali Vaez, was looking at the economic cost of Iran's nuclear program. And remember, we, we talked about that as well. And you know, this is a regime which has poured tens, in the case of the nuclear program, hundreds of billions of dollars when you consider the ancillary costs, economic sanctions, et cetera, for, for things which really don't have much return on investment. The nuclear program can at best provide something like 2% of Iran's energy needs when about 16% of Iran's energy is lost because of faulty transmission lines. And so whether it's pouring billions of dollars into the nuclear program, pouring billions of dollars into Bashar Assad or Shia militias or Hezbollah, 
Um, I think the, the chickens are coming home to roost. And as you, we've seen in some of the slogans people are chanting, you know, forget about Syria, think about us. And, and these places in Iran which are most affected by mismanagement and environmental issues, whether it's um, because of um, poor uh, water management or, or, or the uh, building controls, it's, it's astounding for me when I lived in Iran how it was actually a premium for people to live on buildings that were built before the revolution rather than post-revolution. People wanted to live in buildings you know, pre-1979 because they thought there was a, a more a proper building code than those that were built uh, post-revolution. So I think this is going to be, it's, it's one of those, the, the issue you raise, um, environmental issues, and in, in, in a month ago, a month uh, before, in the month of December, I co-authored a report on Iran's demographics. And it's a country which is, is, big, is, is, is much older um, than many of its regional peers, and they're totally not prepared for the future of an older aging society and how you reform pension systems. And I, I think the challenge the Islamic Republic has is that the leadership, you know, the leader is 77, 78 years old. He's so focused on near-term crises and just making sure he dies as supreme leader that these colossal monumental issues like the country's natural resources, water issues, earthquake. There's an incredible statistic I once heard when I was living in Iran after the BAM earthquake. The British embassy did a study from a British seismologist who estimated there was upwards of 97 or 90 percent chance of an earthquake over seven on the Richter scale in the city of Tehran. You know, that, that could be one of the great uh, uh, natural disasters of modern times, but but I have no indication that the leadership in Iran is, is focused on this, these issues because they're focused on, you know, how do we keep Assad, Assad in power? You know, how do we project our power regionally? How do we suppress an internal insurrection? Another question from the audience? Uh, yes, sir. I'm Mike Nelson with uh, Cloudflare. Uh, this is a question primarily to Colin. Uh, those of us in cybersecurity industry know that you have to worry about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And most discussions about Iran focus on theft of data and DDoS attacks. We don't hear a lot about attacks designed to manipulate databases, whether it's bank records or hospital records or some other critical data set, which if altered, could really undermine trust in institutions. I'm just curious, Colin or anyone else, whether there's been any indication that the Iranians are trying to do this kind of uh, undermining of institutions, not by stealing data, but by altering it and, and maybe deleting every fifth character or something. Well, I would, I would maybe take a step back further in the, the, the sort of chain of progression. And I would say one of the things that I was looking for and I thought that I would see is Iran engaging more in information operations. I was really convinced that the uh, that what Russia did during the U.S. election would inspire uh, Iranian groups to engage in the same behavior during the Iranian presidential election last May. I w especially since you know it's clear that those people have been targeted. It's clear that a, a number of people in Rouhani's uh, circle have, have even been a compl uh, a compromised. And so clearly they must have some sort of uh, embarrassing material about members of, of Rouhani's inner circle. I was thoroughly convinced that you would see some sort of operation to that effect. Uh, but you actually hadn't. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that despite clear indication that a number of organizations, such as opposition organizations outside of the country, uh, have have been compromised that you haven't seen the leaks of embarrassing material or, or this sort of behavior and I, I think that I would be looking uh, For that first I would I would be looking for them to start to instrumentalize uh, and weaponize information before they started to get into more subtle forms of, of, of coercive uh, uh, Campaigns and that just hasn't seemed to, to have occurred uh, I, I don't know if the issue is intent or capacity. I could certainly understand that the Iranians are less likely to attempt to do that or be able to do that towards the United States because what is, what is clear is that 
Iran doesn't seem to understand that actually hacking requires human resources as much as, as technical resources. There are times in which Iran seems to get to a certain level of sophistication which is respectable, uh, engages in certain attacks which are, uh, are you know, credibly complex, and then they're entirely betrayed by the fact that the attackers speak terrible English. Mm, yes. They're like beautiful, you know, like well-written malware, and it's like, Please, dear, open attachment. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Yours, love, truly. All of it, all of it misspelled. <laughs> all of it misspelled. Grammatically strange, yeah. you know. They, they're, for some reason, enough hubris to think that they could try, don't go to Google Translate, and, and end up worse. Um, and, and, and so it's, it's, this is also, they're better at attacking Iranians than they are other people because they know it, Iranians at least. And so that, that to me says that they would be less likely to be able to, to pull off something like, uh, like the, the, the DNC attacks, the, the, the attacks against the Democratic Party, because they don't understand the human resource issues. And so I do think that there is at least a limit of capacity in that they haven't made that investment thus far. But in terms of domestic audiences, uh, maybe I'm, I'm accidentally inspiring them. Maybe I'm like challenging them. I, I apologize. Uh, but I'm surprised that they at least haven't come that far, let alone these sort of more subtle degradation uh, attempts. Just to add two points on that, I, Iran is also a really good case study for, I think, how the government used its offensive cyber tools within, as part of the broader political game and context that was being played, be it the negotiations for the JCPOA and others. So I think there's always the question, what would actually be the incentive for Tehran to conduct these more coercive uh, um, effects, especially given where we are currently in the political environment and the relationship with the U.S. And the second thing that uh, I would add is, actually, it's something that we at Carney at the Cyber Policy Initiative have very concerned about, and we have a project dedicated to the integrity of financial data because we think it's something that might be coming down the pipe in the next five to ten years and that we should be focusing on it. But as Colin just said, right now we are still in the, comf in the not comfortable, but in the position that we haven't seen this yet, but we have lim it's limited to data breaches and DDoS attacks with regard to Iran. Uh, yeah, sorry. Come over here. Thank you, Patrick Tucker with Defense One. I wonder uh, two questions. I wonder if briefly you could describe whether or not you observed any change in Iranian uh, cyber activity following the March 2016 Justice Department indictments of uh, uh, seven Iranians for a particular cyber uh, activity that we ruled to be illegal. Was that, uh, did the activity increase? Basically, did sanctions have any effect on what they were doing? Uh, and the second question is, if you've seen the Quds Force use any of these tactics to uh, any degree, uh, does that differ from the way the rest of the government uses them? Thanks. Uh, so, so I would, I think that, <coughs> that would be, on, on the first question with regard to whether these indictments had, uh, have deterred Iran or not, I think it's difficult to tell. I think that we tried to take a, a, a as broad of a po uh, possible view in terms of the behaviors and, and, and the activity, but it's very difficult to understand internally the calculation, whether somebody decided not to do something because there was a concern about an indictment. Uh, an, an indictment. I think that this also takes place on, uh, within <coughs> the context of, we certainly say that after the, the JCPOA, and certainly during the negotiations as well, that there's overall been a decline in disruptive, uh, disruptive attacks towards Iran and from Iran. And so that seems to be really the overriding political event that is shaping uh, the nature of Iranian behavior rather than the indictments itself. What I would be interested in, uh, which I don't think that we'll ever really know, is at least on a personal basis, uh, how has that shaped the, uh, the decisions of individuals to participate in these campaigns? Do the indictments stop people from, uh, from working for the government? Uh, have they withdrawn? I don't think that we have, at least I haven't seen direct, uh, a, a direct insight into the seven individuals that were indicted and whether they have continued in, to engage in, in, in certain actions. Uh, we certainly see that w often when, when people have been published upon, uh, published, yeah, upon, um, <laughs> Uh, that they tend to disband or change their operations, that it, it does in some way uh, affect uh, their calculation. Um, but we don't necessarily understand to what extent, whether they go away completely, 
uh, and, and whether certain people just have not participated just because they are now fearful of being indicted, that they want to emigrate, for example, and they know that uh, if they are, are named in an indictment that they won't be able to, to, to immigrate from the country. On the, the, the second case, I think, that, I think that we, one of our primary contributions is that we use, uh, that, that I think that we make the most clear case for an affiliation between these groups and the, the Revolutionary Guard. And we do so based off of a, a, a particular insight that only civil society has, which is the direct consequences to individual, uh, individuals as a result of these hacking and the relationship uh, that Kareem described with, with CM Aknamazi of people being arrested and uh, attacks being launched from their accounts that can be directly tied to known uh, threat actors. Uh, those often seem to be, my, my guess has been, although there's not a level of confidence that this is said in the paper. My guess is that this is intelligence parts of the IRGC, but we don't go to a certain extent to say that this is affiliated or asked, for, uh, asked uh, requested by the Quds Force, that this is aligned with certain segments of the IRGC. We just sort of make a, a broader attribution to the, to the Revolutionary Guard. Any other questions from the audience? Um, yes, sir, back there. We've seen them use uh, DDoS. Sorry, can you uh, identify yourself? I'm John Hokelson from FireEye. We've seen the uh, uh, Iranian actors use DDoS in the past with Operation Abibil. I wonder if we've seen anything more recently in the domestic sphere, uh, especially to maybe knock out opposition media or something uh, hosted outside of the country. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I've I've been interested in that especially because. Uh, at the same time that you saw uh, denial of service attacks being used disruptively against, uh, against uh, American banking institutions, you see a number of reports uh, that say, uh, or, or cases in which they were used against uh, Persian language social, social media platforms, uh, Persian language ind independent media sites. The BBC in 2012 disclosed that they were the subject of a denial of service attack that they attributed to Iran timed with the exact same day as the 2012 parliamentary election. Uh, you've seen other cases where even, uh, for example, the Mujahideen, the MEK, said that in tandem with attacks against uh, their, their location in Iraq, uh, which they linked with Shia militants, there was also denial of service attacks against their properties. You've seen this really consistently. What, was, what, what has been interesting is I've reached out to a number of those, those people that were the subject of attacks and asked them if they had seen anything since 2014, 2015, and they actually hadn't seen uh, much at all. And what I attribute that to is, is that, again, you know, in terms of investment of resources under the internet freedom agenda and, and coordinating uh, private sector contributions, this is a, a place in which uh, we've actually excelled. And so uh, there are a number of resources, free or paid for by development agencies, to protect, protect against denial of service attacks. And a lot of those platforms that were targeted uh, now have, have you know, like either free, free Cloudflare services, uh, Google's Deflect service, uh, um, or Google's, um, oh no, uh, Google's free. Shield. Shield, thank you. It's his competitor <laughs> too. Yeah, <laughs> it's very generous. <laughs> um, or, 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 uh, uh, civil society organized efforts such as the Deflect Network. And those have been very uh, very effective at fending off the level of attacks that, that Iranians are, are capable of. And I think that actually that, that improvement of defense has overall uh, you know, disincentivized from Iranians, Iranians from believing that that's a, a, a useful way of knocking people offline. At the, you know, just to, to, to extend that, my answer a little bit too far, the reason why that was especially effective was that the, uh, the, the, the platforms that were being denial of service attacked were often still forced to pay for the bills. And so what you'd have is uh, somebody would be DDoSed and they'd either face a choice. I'm either gonna get a $5,000 Amazon bill or I'm going to, to turn my, my services off until, until I think that they've, uh, they've um, gotten bored. 
And so people will stay down for multiple days after a five minute uh, denial of service attack. So it's just even the threat of a DDoS that, that was effective. And so since we've shifted that and we've been able to provide those resources, you just haven't seen that anymore. You make the interesting point in um, the report that uh, Iranian civil society and um, their internal targets are often sort of the canary in the coal mine yes. for uh, where uh, Iranian threat actors are going to look next and, and or what the methods that they're going to use. And so the private sector and the uh, you know targets potential targets in the West and in the Gulf would do well to sort of pay close attention to um, the, the attacks that, that happen against Iranian civil society. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Here. Hello, I'm Makam Rabah. I'm a lecturer at the American University of Beirut. Actually, I'm interested in two aspects. One aspect, we saw Hassan Nasrallah recently disclose his salary in a way to, uh, to appease these voices calling for tax, Iranian taxpayers' money going to Hezbollah. You think that this would actually resonate within these people? Second, and more importantly, the counterterrorism for these cyber attacks. I feel that, be it the American administration or even uh, Google, or they are playing too nice. So they have a lot of restrictions. When they were trying to counter ISIS, they had so much restrictions on these counter messaging that it was ridiculous. You couldn't use blood, you couldn't use violence. And we know that initially in the Syrian revolution, when the uh, revolutionaries used cyber attacks against uh, Bashar al-Assad, and they got their hands on these uh, pictures of uh, they, they say it's one of his assistants sending him nude pictures. It had a huge effect on his image. Mm -hmm. So why don't we see people reacting, individuals going after these uh, people in Shiraz and actually putting up a real fight instead of telling us they want to counter these messages and do nothing about it? Thank you. You should take it first. <laughs> I, I can maybe take a little bit of the, the, the second part. Um, you know, one of the challenges is, is, is that how do you not only defensively but actively confront uh, these attacks against activists? The reality is, is that the people that are conducting it are, you know, random individuals. And so there's not a lot of surface for retaliation against the attackers themselves. Similarly, if you brought in the, the scope of, of if you were to engage in some sort of active, you know, measures campaign, uh, you know, the, 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 the hardline establishment has been very effective at staying kind of technologically behind for strategic purposes. I don't think that there's a lot of a, as much uh, infrastructure exposed to kind of embarrass them, them through, through retaliating. And so what you've seen instead is, is an emphasis and a focus on the defensive aspect of it, making sure that people are secure. And I think that we have been very effective, again, at providing the tools for the dissidents that are being attacked uh, to protect themselves. But the problem in this case is, is that one, one of the things that attackers are able to exploit is the fact that the, the, open, the internet is open and decentralized. And so when you start to look at the things in which you could potentially curtail uh, individuals that have a malicious intent, you start to look at the sort of uh, 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 measures and organization of the internet. Tim can, can maybe speak more articulately about this. Uh, you start to, to envision a model of the internet that is the one espoused by China and Russia. You know, if you want to absolutely control all of, the, all of the attacks that occur on the internet, you're going to have to start to close down the internet. Um, if you even wanted to, there has, you know, if we talk about using sanctions to deter Iranians, for example, the reality is, is that uh, you know, if you look back at the person who, there was a, a case in which the, there was a Dutch security company that was compromised by Iranians, uh, and in order to issue fake certificates to impersonate Google, to spy on basically all Gmail users inside of the, the, the country. This was an incredibly consequential attack. And the, the fundamental resources that were used to, to orchestrate the attack were servers outside of the country paid for by is a, stole, a, a stolen Israeli credit card. And so even if you wanted to go to such an extreme that you were to cut Iran off of, of most platforms, you still wouldn't be able to 
because malicious actors are going to be malicious actors. And until we start to change the model of the internet that we all appreciate and love and take advantage of, they're also going to take advantage of that model as well. Can I just address the Hezbollah question? I, I read Nasrallah's speech last night, and for, for context, um, several I think it was several months ago, uh, Nasrallah was asked about the risk of uh, US sanctions against Hezbollah, and he said, all of our resources come from Iran, right? All of our resources come from Iran, and so therefore we're impervious to US sanctions. In this speech, in the last 48 hours, he said he was significantly downplaying the support that Hezbollah got from Iran, and particularly the, the, his salary. He said, I only get a salary of about $1,300 $1, a month. Um, and he also went on to say that the people in the streets uh, shouting, um, um, forget about Syria, think about us, forget about Hezbollah, think about us, these are just a very, very small minority of Iranians and the vast majority of Iranians do support Iran's support for Hezbollah and its foreign wars. Um, a couple of things I'd say. One is that um, there, I would argue, are far more people who uh, resent Iran's uh, external spending on Arab wars than the folks we saw in the streets. And this is a, a long time phenomenon. You hear this, um, you know, this has actually been reported for some time um, including at the recent earthquake sites, people saying that if this earthquake had happened in South Lebanon, the government would have been much quicker to react than it had it happened in Iranian Kurdistan. Um, I, I think, you know, if you look at the Islamic Republic, uh, it, it has been the highest exodus of Iranians from Iran in probably the 2,500 year history of Iran. The people have left Iran post-1979. And I think what's uh, many people resent, and I have to say myself included, is that you do have lots of Arab uh, uh, Shiites who uh, have open access to Iran, and they go back and forth, and some of these are, are Arab uh, Shiite journalists who work for Hezbollah news services, and they are operating also in the Western realm, writing pieces for Al Monitor and elsewhere. Um, and you have an individual like Siam Aknamazim, and his father, Bagher Namazi, who, if anyone knows them, are really the embodiment of the uh, Iranian patriots. They're languishing in Evian prison, and you have you know, others who are not even Iranians uh, who are able to go back and forth through the country. So I do think one of, the, one of the battles in Iran today is between the forces of Persian nationalism and Shiite nationalism. And it goes back in some ways to what Kissinger said, is Iran a nation or a cause? And I would argue that many amongst the younger generation Iranians want Iran to be a nation state, which puts its national interests before revolutionary ideology. And when you look at things through that prism, uh, spending tens of billions of dollars on Bashar Assad uh, in order to be part of the resistance against Palestine doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the context of national interests. For a few more. Um, yes, the woman in the back. Um, my name is Tova Abosh. I'm with the Department of Defense. You mentioned earlier in the conversation a lack of resources, of human resources. Do you see any correlations or attempts at active recruitment within the computer programs in the universities, straight into <coughs> cyber programs or straight into the military? And do you see any indications of a willingness to spend more money on this recruitment and a willingness to train people? Some of that is hard to, to, to see externally. I think that you can start to see fragments of that. Um, firstly, one thing to keep in mind is that we aren't able to find any, any cases in which the, the attacks that we're talking about are conducted uh, by members of the military establishment it, it itself. So there's a sort of recruitment, but it's sort of a, a, you know, a public-private initiative, this, this cyber warfare. Um, but that being said, you, you see an increase in, in investments, um, but those are not necessarily a proportional to what you would expect for a country like Iran. And so there was, for example, Rouhani increased the budget for cybersecurity, and there was a lot of attention to the fact that it was like a 1,700 uh, uh, percent increase in a budget. 
But Iran still, that was an increase from maybe like uh, a couple million dollars to tens of millions of dollars. Whereas an American bank alone spends something like hundreds of million dollars, uh, hundreds of million dollars of, uh, on, on information security and, and, and cybersecurity. Iran's investments have been actually fairly minimal for a country of, of 80 million that have been systemically compromised for purposes of, of coercion and, 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 and espionage. And so there is still this, uh, one of the things that I, I'm just surprised is, is that they, they are actually are, are much further behind than they should be. Why haven't they invested more? You've seen uh, an attempt at fostering a, a more professional information uh, security community, certainly. You see uh, an increase of events such as capture the flag tournaments in, in Iranian universities. You do see more uh, uh, cybersecurity programs within the country. You see a greater emphasis by the cyber police on issues of, of fraud and personal security and, and uh, other sorts of economic crime. So what I would say is that I would say, certainly Iran is getting better, uh, but incrementally so. And you don't see the sort of investment that would be proportionate to what you would expect a, a, a more mature country would, where, where they would be at. And the gulf between the two, I think, is, is, is substantial. And I think it will take years. And I think it'll take a greater focus in order to get there. I think we have time for one last question, if anyone has one. Um, yes, this woman here. Oh, you, ma'am, in the, in the sort of middle section. Thank you. Elise Goss Alexander with the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. You had mentioned earlier the two points about um, the ongoing bipartisan support for the internet freedom agenda and about clarifying OFAC licenses and stuff. I was just wondering if you had any other specific policy recommendations based on this report. Well, <clears throat> your, your affiliation was was what exactly? Okay, the reason why I ask is that one of the things we talk about, I know it's a, it's a beast of a report and you probably haven't gotten to the end of it yet because it just came out, but in the end we do talk about some of the attacks on religious minorities, uh, including religious minor Baha'i minorities, Iranian Baha'i minorities in, in the US, and you do talk about some of the policy prescriptions that you know, it's not they're, not, they're not JP Morgan, right? They can't afford to hire Palantir and pay them tens of thousands of dollars a month to protect them. And so one of the things that Colin talks about is that it's important we think about policies and measures to protect these, these organizations who are, who have, you know, are smaller fish, have much more minor resources, but are, are oftentimes uh, the first warning of what's to come, because as we've talked about, same groups that are hacking are going after uh, Baha'i organizations in the U.S. are the oftentimes the same folks going after Aramco or going after infrastructure sites in the U.S. But I, you know. I, I would say one of the problems that we run into, and, and with with the Baha'i, there's a specific case actually, which I think is extraordinary, which is um, that in March 2014 there was a disclosure of a widespread espionage campaign uh, that was very good at uh, at building up a social media presence that looked legitimate in order to conduct uh, espionage against the defendant sector. And there was an FBI report <coughs> that followed a private sector report by EyeSight. There was an FBI bulletin that listed actually the, the profiles that were involved in order to allow companies to see if they were affected, potentially targeted, and respond to it. So this was a set of Facebook uh, uh, profiles, a set of LinkedIn profiles. What was interesting about that is, is that the uh, private sector report had put out like 10 profile names. The FBI had put out something like 46, uh, 52. And, and about 40 of those names had been actually Persian, Persian names. And you think about it, it's like, who's going to try to spearfish the defense sector with a Persian, uh, you know, an Iranian identity? And the reason why that is, is that actually you go back and uh, one of those, uh, this was reported, uh, one of those, those fake profiles was actually impersonating Ambassador Bolton. And that, uh, that fictitious uh, Ambassador Bolton profile had actually targeted a senior member of, of the Baha'i establishment. Uh, 
It was a John Bolton LinkedIn profile, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, also, great English, <laughs> yeah. terrible English. Yeah. Uh, good profile, terrible English. Uh, and, 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 and what I found was that this was a, a really uh, a, a stark uh, example of how much there's a difference of opportunity for organizations in protecting itself. That, that the private sector had released this very well composed, they're not always well composed, but this was well composed, uh, piece of information on protecting yourself against attacks. And civil society was never given access to this. This was privately held until it leaked to a, to a, to a site. And I think, that, I think that this shows the, the differences when civil society are left out of the conversation. That the FBI could have extended that opportunity. The document was going to leak anyway. This, one of those organizations was probably hacked. The, the hackers were going to get it anyway. Uh, so, but, but by sheer virtue of not including civil society or giving them the, the resources, they were less capable of defending themselves against this very consequential campaign. I think that, that there is opportunities for the private sector to invest more in making available resources for securing their users. Uh, right now you have a situation in which during these campaigns, uh, uh, hardline affiliated organizations like Tasneem News are using them in order to identify protesters, and the platforms not having lang Persian language capabilities are not taking down those accounts. Similarly, there's an opportunity to invest more in, in the resources in order to protect users and take down those accounts. There is certainly more opportunity for making sure that the private sector is being responsive to these sorts of attacks, that there's a closer information loop that there are digital security resources that are being made available, and not just being made available to the diaspora, but you know the religious minorities that are inside of the country and further isolated from anything else. Uh, you know, we go into this a, a bit, but there's there's always measures uh, that can be extended, especially when you start to prioritize, you know, dissidents, religious minorities, and understand that they are the canary in the coal mine. If you want to be utilitarian but also just kind of morally the, the center of, of, of these attacks. Um, so this is just a taste of all the insights and information that are in the reports. So I really urge you all to read it. And please join me in thanking the speakers. Thank you.